Hi, my name is Chris Dorn, and I'm going to be talking about interventional pain options for common pain conditions. Um, I've been asked by the organizers to remind everyone that <clears throat> you can put, put in questions by scrolling down uh, at the bottom of the presentation, uh, and then we'll have a Q&A session afterwards. Um, just a, a quick aside uh, about myself. Um, I'm double boarded in anesthesia as well as interventional pain management. Uh, and I moved down here to the Indianapolis area with my family after we finished fellowship up in Chicago. And I originally joined Indianapolis Neurosurgery Group, which has now become Goodman Campbell Brain and Spine. Uh, we have five locations throughout the uh, Indianapolis area and 17 neurosurgeons, four interventional radiologists, and then three other interventional uh, pain physicians, uh, <clears throat> myself being one of those, uh, that are also boarded in anesthesia as well as interventional pain. So, let's get on with our talk here. Uh, real easy, um, no disclosures uh, to mention. Um, when we try to figure out the best way to present uh, this information, really breaks down into three major categories. Um, number one being the therapeutic procedures, um, where we're just trying to get good steroid benefit. Uh, the second being diagnostic procedures, where a lot of times we're looking for good uh, information, whether that's insurance driven or, or possibly uh, for a surgical uh, option, uh, and then finally combination of procedures where we'll get diagnostic information, but also hopefully, again, get that therapeutic benefit from the steroids. Um, <clears throat> like I said, there no diagnostic uh, uh, benefit from the therapeutic injections. It's just a shotgun effect for the most part. We're just putting the steroid in, in a basic area and hoping it does its job. Uh, and what I've done uh, with today's presentation is try to form uh, a lot of patient vignettes uh, from folks that I've seen in the clinic. I'm sure a lot of you folks see in your clinic uh, and just kind of get an idea about what our decision-making process is based on the presentation, imaging, uh, history and physical exam, uh, and then see where we go from there. Uh, so starting off with Stan. Stan is a 55-year-old uh, uh, over-the-truck dr uh, road driver uh, who has had three months of low back pain without radiation into his lower extremities. Um, no precipitating events. Uh, he says he's been taking uh, over-the-counter uh, anti-inflammatories and been doing physical therapy for about a month, but it really hasn't been helping a whole bunch. Uh, he notices a lot of uh, issues when he's standing up from a sitting position. Uh, getting in and out of his truck is difficult, and when he gets up first thing in the morning. Uh, again, no major issues, uh, no red flags as far as weakness or bladder, bladder issues, uh, and his only physical exam finding is uh, facet loading and pain with lumbar extension. So we can take a look at his MRI here, and we'll use the cursor to kind of highlight some areas. Uh, overall, pretty good looking MRI. Um, you know, this is a uh, T2 weighted signal, so everything uh, white is going to be uh, fluid. Uh, and we can see a lot of times we'll see a good healthy hydrated disc here, a little bit higher in the, we'll call that low lumbar, or excuse me, low thoracic upper lumbar. Um, as we get down here into the lower lumbar discs, uh, we can see a little bit less hydration. Uh, but overall, not a terrible looking spine. Uh, here we see the, uh, the disc space, here's the right side, and here is the uh, left side. Uh, and we can see that he's got maybe a little bit of uh, asymmetry out here in the lateral recess, uh, but nothing terrible. The nerve roots look real good as they t come off on both sides. Here are the facet joints on the right as well as on the left. Uh, maybe a little bit uh, thickening of those joints, uh, but again, not terrible. Kind of what we'd expect with this presentation. Uh, our next patient is Mabel. Uh, I've got here that she's a 79-year-old woman, but clearly she looks like she's uh, 89. Um, she's uh, had a little bit different symptoms than standing. Uh, she's complaining more of heaviness in her legs. Uh, this is worse when she's standing and walking. Uh, if she's sitting, she has no problems, uh, she has no pain. Uh, but when you talk to her, she says, well, I can't sit around all day because then I get nothing done. She's found that if she goes to the grocery store and she finds a cart to lean on, and makes it around the grocery, she can do okay, but if you ask her if she can make it through the grocery by using just a basket, she'd say, no, I'd, I'd have to sit and rest. Again, this is a nice lady that's done physical therapy for three weeks, no benefit, and, and her exam actually is less remarkable than Stan's, maybe a little bit of pain with facet loading, uh, but overall strength looks good, sensation looks good, uh, no other issues. Uh, again, she has a little bit different uh, looking MRI, obviously, uh, we're kind of highlighting the L4-5 level here. We can see there's a little bit of uh, buckling of that uh, disc space there at L4-5, pushing towards the thecal sac. Uh, we can see that here on the axial where it's coming down. 
And then we can also see that she's got quite a bit of arthritis. This is that right side of joint, and here's the left. And see, that's really kind of pushing in and making that pretty narrow, causing at least moderate, maybe bordering on severe spinal stenosis at that L4-5 level. Uh, and that's kind of what she's describing with her symptoms. Sounds like neurogenic claudication. Uh, the whole, boy, if I could, if I, when I'm standing and walking, my legs feel like they're gonna give out underneath me, but if I'm sitting, I have no pain. Both of these folks are pretty good uh, uh, candidates for an epidural steroid injection. And again, this is one of the most commonly used interventions that we have, both for disc degeneration as well as spinal stenosis. Uh, the value of the steroids is that they usually stay active for up to three months, and during that time uh, will inhibit the inflammatory uh, cascade and pathway uh, and prevent that mast site degradation and uh, the prostaglandin synthesis. Also directly blocks uh, the C-fiber uh, transmission, which uh, again directly inhibits the pain pathway. Um, in usually more so the spinal stenosis, the mechanical comp uh, compression uh, causes irritation of the nerve roots, uh, resulting in infl inflammation, and this also causes uh, the leakage of the mediators and nerve root edema. Um, the herniated disc material uh, usually has a high concentration of these mediators, uh, and actually as the disc loses height as it becomes, uh, as, it, as it loses its form, uh, that can actually cause leakage of the disc material uh, and again those mediators. Uh, this is just a cartoon uh, showing the uh, general approach uh, for an epidural. You can see kind of a posterior approach uh, passing through the interspinous, uh, interspinal ligament uh, and then just kind of popping through the ligamentum flavin. Uh, to deposit that, uh, that steroid medication uh, posteriorly here. Uh, now, <clears throat> keeping in mind, even for these conditions, a lot of that inflammation is probably going to be on the anterior surface, kind of down here. Um, but a lot of times that steroid is going to make it around uh, anteriorly or to the ventral uh, portion of the, um, of the, of the uh, fecal sac, uh, and usually will do a good job of getting that inflammation down. Um, when we see uh, not as uh, positive results with an epidural. We've got some other options, and we'll talk about those uh, as we go on with the talk. Um, this is just a couple of pictures. Sorry, that one on the, the right is not great, uh, but that's just a, a lateral uh, showing nice uh, uh, layering in the epidural space of the contrast dye. Here we are at the L3-4 inner space. Obviously, we can do these at uh, any level uh, in the spine. Uh, here's kind of a low thoracic epidural. And then we've got a cervical epidural stair injection, kind of at the uh, cervical uh, thoracic uh, junction at C7, uh, T1. Uh, again, usually used for uh, neck, shoulder blade, uh, sometimes upper extremity pain. So that's therapeutic. Um, <clears throat> the next uh, uh, category of uh, injections we'll talk about are going to be the diagnostic. Uh, as I alluded to earlier in the talk, uh, these are usually uh, when we need more information. A lot of this is insurance driven, uh, but there's a lot of times we'll, we'll really need uh, uh, clinical information as well uh, as we're trying to decide whether or not a person might be a surgical candidate, uh, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit here. Uh, a lot of times, the majority of the time, this is gonna cause a temporary relief of pain, but sometimes uh, it'll cause a temporary increase in pain, and that's really the diagnostic response that we're looking for with one of these diagnostic uh, procedures, and we'll talk about that here. First patient, though, is Mary. Uh, Mary is a very nice 63-year-old uh, lady uh, who's had uh, kind of chronic uh, neck pain uh, that's getting a little bit worse over the last uh, six months to, to a year. It does not radiate into her upper extremities, no radicular issues. Uh, she's been through physical therapy. And she's tried cervical traction. She's seen her chiropractor. Uh, currently, she's got a physiatrist who's kind of directing things with physical therapy. She's taking a prescription strength anti-inflammatory, uh, but it's just not getting any better. You know, this is interfering with work and with sleep, and it's really <clears throat> occasionally is going to cause uh, some occipital headaches uh, as well as that left side. Uh, her physical exams, uh, again, pretty unremarkable. Uh, no major issues with uh, deep center reflex, uh, no strength issues, sensation issues. What she does have is a lot of uh, positive left side of facet loading, um, <clears throat> uh, and, and, and it's negative on the right. So we think we know where we're supposed to be looking here. Uh, she, on her MRI, has got, we kind of count uh, down the, uh, the sagittals here, so this is that disc space, we know that's C2-3, here's 3-4, 4-5, 5 uh, And we can see here, uh, again, same thing, right side and left. Uh, 
this doesn't look too bad. Again, a little bit of buckling uh, towards the fecal sac and the spinal cord here. Um, the spinal nerves look real good though, plenty of room there, but she does have a little bit of uh, thickening here in the facet joints. Uh, and what she's describing is, uh, you know, is cervical facet uh, uh, pain. Uh, and we've got some treatment options for that. Usually for this, we're gonna start with medial branch blocks. Um, the medial branches are uh, nerves that uh, travel off of the uh, dorsal root ganglion that are pure sensory nerves. You know, I tell patients that these are the, the nerves that have no other good uh, purpose in life other than to transmit pain signals from the facet joints and then to the spinal cord and the brain. Um, they don't help you do anything useful. A lot of times when people are like, oh, it sounds like a, a scary thing if we're going to talk about, you know, burning the nerves. Um, and I say, you know, these are nerves that you just don't need. You know, that uh, arthritic information there uh, is not beneficial uh, and, it, and it won't prevent you from uh, not, feeling your, uh, not feeling if you've injured yourself in any other way in the neck low back, thoracic spine. Um, we use these uh, injections to identify the facet joints as the primary pain generators. Uh, and usually this is, again, purely diagnostic block. Uh, early on in my career, uh, 11 years ago, I used to put steroid in these areas just to try and get the patients a little bit of benefit, you know, for a couple weeks in between uh, doing these diagnostic blocks that are usually required by insurance. Uh, insurance started uh, kicking those back and saying, oh, it's, if you're using steroid, it's not purely diagnostic anymore which is kind of ridiculous, but because of that, now we just use diagnostic, or we just use local anesthetic uh, in these injections. And again, the only reason to do these really is if your end plan is gonna be rhizotomy. Uh, most insurance companies do require a series of two positive diagnostic blocks uh, prior to approving the rhizotomy. Uh, and this is kind of an, a view, this is a little bit higher than what uh, Mary had on her scan, <clears throat> but just an example of uh, the, uh, the lateral, I usually do these injections uh, with the patient in the lateral position, come down to the articular pil pillar, and this is where in the neck, the uh, medial branches will run uh, here at C3, C4, and then C5. You can see here we've got our needles right here, kind of right in kind of the middle of that articular pillar, on uh, a good spot to do a field block uh, for the medial branches. Uh, this is a left-sided thoracic uh, picture uh, for medial branches, uh, and here we have obviously the right-sided uh, medial branches at L4-5. Um, what I talked about earlier, you know, patients a lot of time will call this the burning of the nerves. Obviously, that's uh, kind of a misnomer. Really, what it is is a it, we're basically we, we're heating the nerves up to a little bit warmer than body temperature. And what this does is damages the nerves to the point when over about two to four weeks after the procedure, they disintegrate, they fall apart, and when they do that, they can't transmit their pain signals anymore. Again, like we talked about earlier, we're not actually treating the cause of this pain, like we're not doing anything about the fact that they still have arthritis, we're just decreasing their ability to feel it. Um, you know, relief is rarely 100%. I'm always very, um, very upfront about our expectations uh, for the rhizotomy. Uh, and usually, you know, for lumbar, uh, we'll say, gosh, if we can get 50% uh, reduction in pain, that's kind of our, our floor, our baseline. Hopefully it's better than that. Uh, for cervical spine, sometimes it can be as high as 60 to 70%. Um, but again, obviously everybody's different. But the vast majority of folks, when they uh, have a nice positive diagnostic block uh, twice, they usually do get really good long-term relief uh, with the rhizotomy. Uh, the reason we don't <coughs> bend, we don't uh, bill it as a, uh, as a permanent fix is these are peripheral nerves and they absolutely will grow back over time. Uh, hopefully what will happen is as those nerves are regrown, is they'll miss. Um, sometimes that happens, a lot of times it does not. Uh, and so, you know, we're always quick to tell the patients that there's a good chance that this will come back over time. Hopefully it doesn't. Uh, this guy is a, a little bit different. I know that this whole talk is supposed to be about um, interventional options for common pain con uh, conditions. Uh, this is a little bit more of a zebra. Uh, again, a diagnostic procedure that's, that's kind of unique and, and used rarely, but, but one that I thought would be uh, fun to talk about. Um, this is Barry. Barry has had low back pain and lower extremity pain for over three years. Uh, he's already had some surgery. I uh, had a left-sided uh, hemilaminotomy. Um, at the L5-S1 level, but he's been known to have these PARS defects, uh, as well as it's real tight there where the, at the, uh, the frame is where those nerves uh, travel past. The question we've got is he's also got an annular tear at L4-5, so is there a chance that this could be painful as well? Uh, this guy has been through the gamut of uh, pain procedures and conservative treatments, including physical therapy. Uh, he's had more injections than he can count. He actually even had a spinal cord stimulator placed by another pain physician 
he was referred to a neurosurgeon colleague of mine uh, and uh, because he's been having increased low back pain and uh, worsening of his right lower extremity pain about a year after he had that uh, stimulator placed. Uh, he's taken some neuropathic pain medications, um, but really uh, no narcotics. You know, for this guy, we're looking here on the, the side. Uh, so already our neurosurgeon is pretty convinced that this 5-1 area uh, is, is definitely one of his pain generators. Uh, and this is where he had his previous surgery. Um, with that, that L5 uh, PARS defect. Uh, I think there's a little bit of instability there. Uh, and so we know that this area is gonna get fused. The question is, just above that, is this L4-5 level causing problems? We can see here on the, uh, on the axial view uh, that there is this little uh, hyperintense area here. That's an uh, annular tear. And sometimes these tears can produce pain. Um, a lot of times also though, when it's a painful disc, we'll see uh, what's called modic changes or inflammatory changes actually in the end plates themselves here at L4 as well as at the superior end plate at L5. We don't see those, but again, we're trying to make sure uh, that if this guy uh, has pain at that 4 or 5 level, he gets one surgery and not two. When we fuse the 5 1 area and he comes back and says, Oh no, I'm still hurting, he's going to be a good candidate for something called a discogram. A discogram is kind of an uh, interesting. Uh, uh, diagnostic test that we have. Uh, we're actually uh, we're advancing uh, needles into the uh, uh, into the nucleus uh, th or through the annulus and into the nucleus of the disc itself, and then pressurizing that disc uh, to see if we can reproduce pain symptoms. Um, <clears throat> it's a it's an interesting phenomenon because we not only will uh, have a target disc, and in this gentleman we can see here, uh, target disc is the L45 level, uh, and then we come up here. Uh, and we target, uh, and then we have a control disc uh, at L3-4. The control disc shouldn't have any issues with it. Um, you know, they're, they're, we should not be suspicious that this is a painful disc. Um, we do this uh, because the idea is if we uh, target a control disc or a, a non-degenerated uh, or non-painful disc, we should be able to pressurize it and not have any, and not reproduce any sort of pain symptoms. Um, we need that because uh, the idea is if we pressurize uh, a disc that has a uh, that does uh, reproduce pain, uh, we should be able to uh, see response usually pretty quickly, and that just kind of uh, adds to the diagnostic value of this that we were able to say, well, we weren't suspicious about L34. We pressurized that to the maximum, re reproduced no pain, and at L45. Um, we pressurized it and we got a, a pain response that was uh, identical to the patient's normal pain at a low pressure change. Uh, this is just a, a little cartoon again, uh, just showing the types of tears that we see uh, that can sometimes reproduce pain. Uh, and of course, the, the worse the tear is, the grade four or the grade five uh, are usually gonna be uh, more painful or, the, or more likely to be painful uh, uh, in a discogram uh, and could require surgery. Now I say this, like I said, this is a zebra though. Um, and actually this gentleman uh, was not positive at L4-5. He did not actually need to have surgery at that level. And so he ended up just getting his fusion at L5-S1 and has done very well. Um, we produce, uh, excuse me, we, my uh, surgeon partners uh, typically will do um, about 6,000 lumbar cases uh, a year. Uh, and I can tell you that between my partners and I, maybe we see a handful of these discograms uh, throughout the course of the year. It's, it's a pretty rare thing um, to have a disc or to have a discogenic pain. Um, it does still exist. Um, and I th just thought I'd mention it because it's an interesting diagnostic uh, procedure that we do, rarely. Um, so that's all the therapeutic, it's all the diagnostic. Uh, we're now on to the, uh, the combination procedures. Uh, this is where we're not only interested in diagnostic information, um, but we also want to make things feel better. And these are your, your more typical transframinal injections uh, or uh, selective nerve injections. I'll use those terms kind of interchangeably, uh, they're very similar. Um, these are nice uh, to have when we're trying to figure out uh, where, uh, you know, if a patient has multiple levels of uh, foraminal narrowing, uh, if we target just one of those, can we target the, or can we find the most painful area if they need a surgical option? Um, and just do surgery on that one level as opposed to several that they may not need. Uh, sacred iliac joint injections, piriformis muscle injections, and then finally the uh, ganglion impar or the tailbone or coccyx injections. 
Our next patient here is Larry. I uh, love this picture, Larry. Larry is hurting. Uh, Larry uh, is a 39-year-old guy uh, who was pretending he was a 19-year-old guy and he helped a buddy move a couch over the weekend. Uh, he woke up the next day with left lower extremity pain uh, and has been in pretty severe pain for about 10 days. Had a visit to the emergency room where he got some uh, Toradol and, uh, and uh, some muscle relaxers and a steroid dose pack. Uh, he's had radiant pain uh, down his buttock, posterior thigh, calf, and ankle. Uh, thankfully, no weakness uh, and no issues with loss of control of bowel or bladder. He does have a positive straight leg raise, uh, and he does also uh, have a decreased Achilles reflex. We'll call it a, a trace on the left plus two on the right. And he's got an MRI that looks kind of like what you'd expect. As we can see here, uh, honestly, above that level, and L, here's the L5-S1 level, and above that, everything looks pretty good. Discs look nice and symmetrical. Uh, down here, we can see that certainly there's a herniated disc, uh, and that is bulging out, uh, again, catching that left S1 nerve root. Here's the S1 nerve. It's kind of being compressed. Here it is on the right. Everything looks great, uh, but certainly that's a disc herniation that's going to cause a lot of pain, uh, and that we'll see these patients usually acutely. Um, <clears throat> so the question is with this, um, study looked at uh, what's the best way to treat these, these patients. Uh, is it an epidural, is it a caudal, or is it that transforaminal approach? Uh, and so a study over a decade ago looked at all three of these methods uh, and they looked at contrast dispersion patterns uh, and tried to correlate that with pain relief. And so if they, had, if they saw ventral, uh, ventral contrast uh, spread, they would say that was between the dura and the posterior longitudinal ligament. ligament. Uh, if there's posterior spread, it's between the dura and the ligamentum flavum, uh, or uh, AP uh, could be both anterior and posterior. Um, they did injections for all these folks, evaluated them at three months and six months, uh, and looked at the results, which were um, that by the three-month and six-month uh, uh, time points, the transframal group uh, for this exact pain, for this S1 type pain, had significantly more patients with either complete or at least partial relief over uh, the caudal and the interlaminar patients. Um, there's definitely more of an uh, incidence of a complete pain relief uh, with ventral spread, uh, and this happened more frequently with that transframal approach because really it's kind of it's forcing that uh, the contrast and then obviously the, the steroid and local anesthetic anteriorly or ventrally uh, where that inflammation is the worst, uh, kind of like what we talked about earlier uh, with the epidural. We're hoping the medicine makes it around into that area, um, and a lot of times it does, uh, but again, when it's more radicular pain, this seems to be a much better approach uh, for that inflamed uh, nerve root uh, or dorsal ganglion, uh, dorsal root ganglion, excuse me. Um, and, and really, they just they uh, said that the rationale why these uh, uh, why these help, why you need a ventral spread, uh, is because those herniations are usually posterior to the, in, uh, to the vertebrae, and that inflammation occurs uh, usually in that ventral area. And applying st uh, steroid directly to the site of inflammation, we know it's a, usually it's going to be a particulate steroid, especially for lumbar injections. And we know that's going to sit in place for about three months and work, uh, and that's why the patients uh, were postulated to have better uh, response with that ventral epidural spread. <clears throat> and here we can kind of see, again, cartoon. Um, Usually it's going to be an oblique angle that we come in, and we really target that uh, kind of area just outside of the uh, posterior ramus of the dorsal root ganglion. Again, normally, like we had for the epidural, we came straight down and put that medicine uh, right here after we popped through the posterior longitudinal ligament. This one, actually, we're directing that again more anteriorly, um, and usually for, again, uh, that radicular pain, this is usually much more effective. Uh, we can see here, this would have been Larry's injection. He had a left S1 select nerve root injection. We can see really nice uh, contrast dye. It really kind of obliterates the, uh, the foramen. Uh, we can see it here on the right side, kind of look like a cat's eye. <clears throat> and that's what it looked like before we put that contrast dye in there. Uh, we can see here, we could obviously do this in the thoracic as well as the uh, cervical. And here's a uh, T11 select nerve root injection. And there's just another cartoon about a cervical select nerve root injection. Again, these are more... Um, these are done quite as commonly, uh, usually requires, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, repetition uh, and a lot of, uh, a lot of training uh, because there's just a lot of vascularity uh, in the cervical spine, more so than the, the lumbar or, th or thoracic, and we really are trying to do our best uh, to avoid these, uh, these arteries. Usually that's going to be a 55 degree angle from the oblique that will come in and kind of slide uh, to the posterior aspect uh, of that nerve root. Uh, usually gives us really effective uh, 
uh, spread of that uh, steroid medication. And we'll usually see an X-ray <clears throat> contrast dye spread uh, just like this, again, kind of on that right C7 uh, foramen. Um, <clears throat> next patient is Yuna. Uh, Yuna is a uh, very nice lady. I know her very well, actually. She's uh, my uh, wife's grandmother, uh, and she is an 86-year-old who, a few years ago, had a slip and fall on the ice in February, and she was having some right buttock pain that radiated down to her posterior thigh, but stopped above her knee. Um, fairly constant, but definitely worse with sitting uh, and driving, uh, and sometimes when she was sleeping, it would wake her up. She was actually more comfortable to stand. Uh, than she was to sit. Uh, again, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories. Uh, her physical exam uh, only positive for the right-sided shear test, Faber sign, Gaines-Lenz, and thigh thrust tests. Uh, basically, all of the sacroiliac joint tests she's positive for, negative for any sort of radicular uh, uh, test uh, with this. Uh, and again, at, for her, we don't have any imaging. But a lot of times for sacroiliac joint pain, you don't really need any because there isn't a good image for SI joint pain that's, that's truly uh, you know, diagnostic to say, oh gosh, you know, it's a lumbar MRI, I can see a herniated disc and it's pressing on a nerve and that, that's where that pain's coming from. We don't really have that for SI joint. You can get x-rays or CTs, it'll sometimes show a thickening of that joint line, but really sacroiliac joint uh, pain is diagnosed with a good history and physical. And again, and again it may count for up to 10, 15% of all quote unquote low back pain. Um, and a lot of times it's due, again, like, like I said, you know, I see these patients, and you'll probably see these patients too, if we have a really icy February, come March and April, they're like, oh, I had this pain that kind of started off low and slow, and then, oh my gosh, it just got a lot worse. Um, <clears throat> it's usually due to that uh, arthritis of an SI joint, that then gets irritated, and sometimes can have a little bit of instability, um, uh, and that causes that kind of constant uh, inflammatory change, and that never has a chance to calm down. Um, we use the combination here with local anesthetic as well as steroid. Uh, and again, this is one of those that we'll do without an MRI um, because, uh, again, the best diagnostic test we're going to have is to be to do an injection and put some local anesthetic as well as steroid in that joint line and see how the patient responds. If it's positive, just like with all these diagnostic blocks, uh, usually the response is going to be within about five or ten minutes. Might get, might get local anesthetic benefit for up to a few hours, uh, but really it's that first initial, you know, within five or ten minutes after the injection, how are you feeling? Do you have any of your typical pain? Um, and if not, then obviously we're in the right spot, and we just have to let the steroids work. Uh, this is a <clears throat> good example of a sacroiliac joint arthrogram. Uh, we can see here we got really good dye spread. Uh, we always enter for SI joints, kind of in that uh, kind of you know, bottom third, uh, if you will. It's where the joint tends to be the, uh, the widest, easiest to, uh, to access with a needle. Um, but if we get in there good, we can usually see a really nice uh, contrast dye. That's running right along that joint line uh, and all the way around. Uh, and it usually indicates a really good block of that SI joint. Um, <clears throat> for SI joint pain, I should mention before I move on to, uh, to Ashley, um, mainstays of treatment for that physical therapy uh, and injection. If we're not getting far enough with either one of those uh, options, either injections uh, are not helping or not lasting long enough, uh, or the therapy just isn't as effective as it should be, um, there, is, uh, there is an option for a SI joint fusion. I've got a few partners uh, in my practice who, uh, who offer that. Um, it's more rare though, certainly. Uh, I would say the vast majority, overwhelming majority of folks do get better with conservative treatments. But just so you know, there is uh, a lot of times another option. Uh, but sometimes that can be insurance um, dependent uh, as well. It's not all insurance uh, programs uh, will approve an SI joint fusion. Um, <clears throat> our next patient here is Ashley, a very nice 42-year-old uh, young woman who's got a six-month history of left-sided buttock pain that radiates down the uh, posterior thigh and into the calf. <clears throat> she can't think of anything that bothers or that would have caused this, uh, but she's always been very active. She's a runner and a biker and does yoga, um, and this pain is really starting to irritate her when she's trying to do these activities for too long. Uh, a lot of times what will trigger this mostly is going to be with sitting. Standing, walking, not usually that uncomfortable. Again, but with riding uh, a bike and running, though, it, it will reproduce that pain. Um, physical exam, pretty unremarkable. No weakness. Reflexes are fine. Straight leg raise is negative, uh, which uh, always, is pretty much all, almost always uh, positive when it comes to a pinched nerve or a sciatica. Uh, but she does have positive pain with when you palpate the kind of the posterior lateral aspect of her buttocks and then perform a piriformis provocation test. 
MRI is unremarkable. You know, this is one of those things that certainly smells like and, uh, and looks like and sounds like, uh, you know, a sciatic nerve issue, which it is, but it's just not coming from the uh, lumbar spine. What she's got an issue is, is with her uh, piriformis. And so <clears throat> we can see here, this is our sciatic nerve, and this is doing what it uh, normally does, which is kind of uh, dives posteriorly or, or, or inferiorly to that piriformis muscle. Again, the piriformis uh, comes from the greater trochanter of the femur and inserts over on the lateral border of the sacrum. Um, the majority of folks look like that picture there. 90% of the of folks walking around have a, uh, have a piriformis nerve and a, a sciatic or excuse me, a piriformis muscle and sciatic nerve uh, that look just like that. Um, but certainly up to 10% uh, uh, can have uh, uh, an issue with the uh, sciatic nerve uh, either partially or completely uh, being entrapped by that piriformis muscle. And as that piriformis muscle uh, gets tense, gets tight, um, it can pinch down on the sciatic nerve and, and reproduce like a sciatica. Again, pretty much everybody with this issue has had an MRI that, that looks normal and they say, well, I don't know what's going on. Um, always think piriformis is another option uh, for where this pain could be generated from. Same thing. Uh, this is a, a very common uh, uh, treatment with, uh, with an injection. Again, local anesthetic is going to give us that good diagnostic information. The steroid we put in there will help decrease the inflammation of that piriformis muscle. Uh, we can see here that here's our uh, kind of the head of the femur, and then here's our border of the sacrum over here. We kind of get into that uh, kind of border or that lateral third of the uh, piriformis muscle, which should be uh, nice and far away from the sciatic nerve. Uh, we get good contrast dye, see a good myogram, inject the medications, uh, and then we usually follow that up uh, with physical therapy. The vast majority of folks, again, with this, do uh, very well with physical therapy. <clears throat> Again, at the end of the day, is there a surgical option for this? Uh, yes, in extreme cases, uh, you can actually uh, cut that piriformis uh, muscle uh, and release the sciatic nerve from it, uh, and things get better from there. Uh, but again, it's not something that we usually uh, need to go towards. Most people get better, vast majority of folks get better with conservative treatments. I think this is our last patient here. Um, this is Mike. Uh, Mike is a 45-year-old gentleman uh, who had a six-month history of a slip and fall on the ice uh, and landed straight down uh, on his uh, backside. Um, I've got this, uh, uh, this guy slipping on the ice, but this is also, uh, interestingly enough, uh, it, this particular condition, when we see it in males, um, it's a lot of times it's gonna be um, firefighters, police officers, uh, construction workers, sometimes uh, that'll get trauma, uh, you know, with a fall, um, with those particular type of, uh, uh, of occupations. He's got severe pain located in his tailbone area when, on, when he uh, sits down on, say, uh, a hard surface like a, like a pew in church um, or, or, a, uh, or a, a hard chair. Um, usually he's pain-free otherwise. If he's standing, he's uh, completely pain-free. This is usually the guy, this and this, uh, actually all, all these last couple folks, the sacroiliac joint patient and the piriformis patient, usually these are the folks that are standing when you walk in the room. Most everybody else, at least in my uh, clinic, you know, seems to be sitting. The folks with uh, tailbone, uh, piriformis, and sacroiliac joint pain are either standing or maybe they're sitting off to the side. It's almost one of those things you can kind of walk in the room and say, mm, I think I know where this is going to go. Um, he really has no radiation of this pain. Uh, it's really just basically the size of a quarter, uh, kind of right up, uh, above his anus. Um, and it's, his physical exam really, again, unremarkable, except for significant pain over that tail tailbone uh, with palpation. Again, this is a guy, absolutely, he's gonna have a lumbar MRI. He also may have <clears throat> a, uh, an MRI or a CT uh, of his pelvis. And sometimes that's when we can start to figure things out. Um, because for him, this is a, a cartoon uh, of the type of injection we do for this, uh, which is basically uh, a, um, a block at the uh, uh, coccyx, at the ganglion impar. You see this is kind of the terminus uh, of our nerve chain here. Uh, and so what we do is we approach, uh, it's usually it's straight uh, posterior until, excuse me, it's a straight lateral. Uh, and we can see that needle pass through the sacrococcygeal ligament uh, until it's just anterior uh, to the sacrum. We inject our contrast dye. We look for a nice kind of spread, and we call it a reverse comma sign in this area. Obviously, making sure to stay far away uh, from the rectum and lower colon there. 
Um, this is a, an injection that a lot of times, if there has been trauma though, whether it's male or female, is sometimes we can actually see uh, a dislocation uh, of these lower uh, coccygeal uh, segments. Uh, and if that's the case, if we do see uh, significant uh, displacement of those lower segments, and a lot of times you can, uh, you can catch this too uh, with a special type of x-ray. Um, what I'll do is I'll order a standing and sitting lateral coccyx x-ray, looking for uh, instability of the, uh, of the lower segments of the coccyx. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of times what we'll see is as those patients uh, sit or stand is that uh, tip of the coccyx will either flip back or flip up. Uh, and, and then a lot of times we'll have our, our diagnosis. Majority of the time, this, uh, the steroid injection can help quite a bit, uh, just like with uh, these other, uh, uh, the other couple uh, of pain patients that we talked about. Um, for this, yeah, there is also a surgical options if necessary. And if there is a lot of instability, uh, that may be a better uh, route to go after we've uh, done our nice diagnostic block. And if we're not seeing a whole lot of steroid benefit, uh, you can actually remove those uh, bottom segments of the coccyx, and once those are gone and they're not moving around and irritating things, uh, pain gets a lot better. And we can kind of see here. Uh, here is that, uh, again, that picture from the lateral. We can see here is our needle coming in. Uh, and you can see you got a little, uh, did a little contrast dye. We saw where it must have been the uh, sacral coccygeal ligament. weren't quite far enough yet, so pushed through a little bit more. And here we see that nice layering of the contrast dye. Uh, everything looks fantastic. No vascular uptake, obviously, uh, uh, no uptake uh, into the intestine um, or colon. Uh, safe to inject our medicine there. Uh, the nice thing is, you know, with this uh, uh, tailbone injection, if there's not a lot of instability, people usually respond really well to this uh, and usually have nice long-term relief. Um, again, this is just one of those uh, kind of common uh, pain conditions uh, that we see. And again, these are certainly not common, uh, or excuse me, as far as the, the Cox injection, uh, some of these are, are a little bit more uh, rare, but certainly something that we do have treatment options for um, and that you'll still see you know, in your practice. Um, that's all I've got uh, as far as my uh, patient vignettes and the uh, interventional um, options for um, common uh, and sometimes less common uh, uh, pain, or, uh, pain presentations. Um, <clears throat> with all of this, I, I, I hope that um, I was able to convey that not only do we have uh, interventional options, but it, just about every one of these folks that came in already uh, had conservative treatments, you know, had physical therapy. Uh, I use that as a huge mainstay in my practice. Uh, with the exception of the folks that are really acute, uh, unless it's unless it's insurance driven, say they need to get physical therapy before they can have an MRI or or an injection. Most of the folks, 90% of the folks I see, if they haven't had physical therapy, I'm going to send them because uh, we really want to exhaust those conservative treatments first uh, before we get into the more uh, aggressive uh, conservative treatments with injections. Um, the goal with all this is to uh, get our patients feeling better by doing as little as possible to them. Uh, and, and a lot of times we're able to accomplish that uh, with a myriad of these treatment options, uh, with physical therapy, uh, with sometimes non steroidal anti-inflammatories, neuro neuropathic pain medications, injections, chiropractic, uh, acupuncture. Um, you know, really, uh, some folks are, are going to require several different uh, ways to attack these, uh, these pain uh, issues, uh, and we really have quite a bit at our disposal uh, when it comes to conservative treatments. Um, I think that's all I've got, and I guess we'll start the, uh, the Q&A uh, shortly here. Thank you.